evening. My name is Seth Hancock, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about the subject of capital punishment. Capital punishment is defined as execution for putting a condemned person to death, yet the common term among society today is the death penalty. The major claim in which I will propose to you tonight is that capital punishment fails to deter homicidal crime. The idea that the death penalty deters criminals from the act of murder has been a common misconception Amer among Americans for years. In the 2000 United States presidential election, President George W. Bush declared, capital punishment deters crime, and that deterrence is the only valid reason for capital punishment. It is my direct intention to prove to you tonight the invalidity of that statement and the misconception that we all have been faced with. The first, second clear, the first secondary claim that I'll present to you is the idea that criminals do not fear the impact of the death penalty. As human beings, if we do not fear the consequences of some action, then chances are that action will be taken. There are multiple reasons why criminals do not fear capital punishment. The first reason why is that not many of the inmates on death row across the states that enact capital punishment will actually be executed. The U.S. Department of Justice provides that at the end of the 2007 calendar year, 35 states, 35 states in the federal prison system held 3,220 prisoners under the sentence of death. However, from that time in 2007 to through the entire 2008 year, only 37 of these inmates in prison for murder were actually executed. A website that argues for capital punishment called ProDeathPenalty.com admits that since 1967, on average, there has been one execution for every 1,600 murders. Murderers come to the realization that their time for execution is likely to never arrive. Another reason why capital punishment does not place fear into the minds of some people is because oftentimes murder cases Murder cases are inspired by passion, where the criminal does not even consider the consequences simply because the marginal benefit of killing some person heavily outweighs any other option. Consider, for example, as the former mayor of New York, Edward Koch, points out, the tragic death of Rosa Velez, who happened to be home when a man named Luis Vera burglarized her home in Brooklyn. Yeah, I shot her, Vera admit admitted, and I don't care about that chair, in reference to the electric chair. As this case suggests, many individuals like Luis Vera know the possible consequences, yet put those aside because the passion of killing another being is too great. Lastly, I will point out the idea of the insanity plea that many prospective murderers realize as an option to escape the death penalty. For example, a case from New York where a law professor will not stand trial for, for killing his pregnant fiance after pr prosecutors accepted his insanity plea. Prosecutors said that accepted said they accepted Michael Lauder's plea of not responsible by means of mental defect because they conceded that no jury would convict him of murder. In legal terms, a person is insane and is not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time of such conduct he was unable to appreciate the nature and quality or the wrongfulness of his acts. However, the key phrase in this definition is at the time. Insanity can often times be measured by, the, by using chemical balances in the brain as judgment. However, not all insanity is definite, meaning it can come and go, essentially saying that any man or woman convicted of murder could state that at the time of the murder took place, they're facing a condition of insanity. The next claim I'll state is that states that enact capital punishment do not have an upper hand in comparison with those states that do use capital punishment. Death penalty info.org points out, for 2008, the average murder rate of the death penalty states was 5.2, while the average murder rate of the states without the death penalty was 3.3. As expert witness.com witness points out, among states since reenactment of the death penalty, there has been no convincing decline in homicidal cases that would conclude the idea of the death penalty acting as a deterrent. In opposition to Bush's statement in 2000, this evidence suggests that having the death penalty as a consequence for murder is not statistically proved that it deters crime. The last secondary claim that I'll introduce is the simple fact that execution contradicts the idea of murder being illegal. Some citizens have faith in government to do the right thing, and when they see the government executing human beings, they question the fact that killing is immoral. Rudolf Joseph Gerber, the author of The Top Ten Death Myth, a book in which he points out deterrence being a myth of the death penalty, speaks of a factor called the brutalization effect. He states, some research claims to find a counterproductive brutalization effect instead of any turn effects following executions. Some studies of homicidal rates after highly publicized executions show that certain disturbed persons 
learning about an impending or completed execution, interpret the execution as a governmental modeling of killing, suggesting to their minds that killing therefore becomes an acceptable means of righting wrongs. Thus, some researchers have found that, homicidal, that homicides increase in some periods just before and just after an execution, especially a highly publicized execution. Muhammad Gandhi once stated, an eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. This perhaps the idea among many prospective murderers who wonder why they cannot kill, yet the government can. In our democracy of the people, many murderers think execution enforced by government is a sort of permission slip for them to execute as well. I hope that with the abundance of evidence, you two agree with my major claim, that being that capital punishment fails to deter homicidal crime. All right, Seth, uh, you state the proposition very clearly. I thought the presentation was pretty effective except for the eye contact. It sounds very smooth and polished. Uh, you do want to sit, sign, excuse me, uh, preview the contents a little bit more. You signpost the individual points as you get to them, although in the middle of the presentation it seemed to me like the points started running together and I couldn't tell you exactly how many supporting points there were and sometimes it seemed like a couple of things that you had belonged together into one category, but uh, because of the way it is structured uh, earlier it's hard to tell. I thought you did a very good job citing your sources uh, consistently and you had a variety of information. You had an example, uh, you had some statistical information. I think you needed a little bit more statistical information on that third point. You've got the expert opinion there that is, describes it, but then they say some studies reach these conclusions but we don't get any data on that particular point. Um, and like I said, you cite your sources very consistently. All right, thank you.